And thank you for coming this evening. It's, uh, it's great to see everybody here today. And it's a real great pleasure for me to welcome Professor Richard Siegel, who's come to visit us from very, very far away. He's come all the way from Hamilton College, which is uh, near New York. And I believe right now he's from New Mexico, so that's even further away. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, and we look forward to your talk. And I'd like to hand it over now to Dr. Abhishek Amar to introduce you and to chair the session. So thank you for being here. Professor Richard Seeger did his undergraduate work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in his two masters and a PhD from Harvard University. He is currently Bates and Benjamin Chair of Classical and Religious Studies at Hamilton College. His field of study is the modern West with a focus on the religious traditions of the United States. Most of his publications are related to the history of East-West encounter. His first major publication was on the World Parliament of Religions with Indiana University Press. He has also published two other monographs, uh, one of which is Buddhism in America with Columbia University Press, and the other one is Encountering Dharma with University of California Press. These and his other publications are concerned with the importation of Asian religions to the US. He is currently working on issues and a book related to yoga in the, West, in the US in conjunction with Yoga Institute of Houston, Texas. He has also been on the board of advisors to the Harvard Pluralism Project. His talk today is titled Yoga and Nationalism, A View from the U.S. So he's somebody who works on the U.S., not in India, though he has a lens from there. So I uh, welcome Richard. And Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start, I think, in uh, the uh, Vice Chancellor of the Department of Historical Studies for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, thank you for coming. It's always a pleasure to see students. I almost feel as though I look at the back of Hamilton. but it's very familiar. Um, today I'm going to weave together an argument about yoga and nationalism, starting by looking broadly at the world's parliament of religions of 1893 and its legacy. Now, the parliament is a paradigmatic east-west encounter event. Uh, both Buddhism and Hinduism and a number of other traditions are said to be formally introduced to the United States and the West at this 1893 event, which is held in Chicago, Illinois. It's considered the onset of the Hindu mission to the West. And uh, there's a central, the, the, the topic here is really a century long discourse about Hinduism, nationalism, and yoga as expressions of what Foreign Affairs Magazine, which is kind of a state policy magazine in the US, called Yoga Diplomacy, and Hinduism today referred to as soft power yoga. And my general thesis is that soft power yoga is a concrete, even though quite protean phenomena, with multivalent means in different social contexts. So I'm going to talk about all of those things uh, with particular attention to historical context. I want to underscore at the outset that this is a view from the US. I'm, after all, you know, an American. I've spent many years of my life involved in thinking about India, but always through those kinds of filters that you get in the US. I'm trained in what is the American field. I'm an Americanist. And that's got its own historiographic structures and preoccupations. And the East is actually kind of marginal to them. So I've been thinking about the East-West encounter off in a little corner of a field that's usually devoted to the history of Protestant Christianity in America by and large. Um, uh, this also, as Abhishek suggested, I have a limited grasp of Hindu domestic politics, Indian domestic politics. So it's been very interesting to me to be over here for the last few days, because a big chunk of my talk will be about Narendra Modi to see precisely how polarizing he can be as a figure. Um, my view doesn't need to polarize one way or the other. We're talking about something a little differently. 
At the outset, I want to just talk a little conceptually to make sure we're on the same page, how we're thinking about things. Nationalism, first of all. When you study the modern field, nationalism you find is ubiquitous. This taking of ancient traditions and harnessing them to peoplehood or nationhood or the state happens kind of everywhere. It's left wing, it's right wing, it's centrist, it's political, it's hard to avoid. And I, I reason I start with this particular slide because this is a humorous, you know, Punch magazine is a humorous magazine in Britain. It's running a kind of a send up of the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893, where the, the Parliament is held. So what you're looking at here is really a humorous view of American cosmopolitan nationalism. You know, and American nationalism sort of provides the stage on which the Parliament plays out. Now, our real concern, however, is uh, with and I'll, I'll give you a few details on the parliament as we move on, with what, what really makes the parliament kind of special, and certainly what has me here, is to talk about the east-west encounter aspects of it. And the fact that there were at least three, if not more, individuals at the parliament who subsequently played a very big role, not only in bringing Asians to the west, but were deeply embedded in nationalist agendas back in their own country. One you're probably familiar with, Dharma Pala, uh, who was involved with theosophy, a very important movement in the 19th. He is the, among the founders of what some people now refer to critically as the Protestant Buddhism of Sri Lanka. And uh, Soyan Shaku, you probably have not heard of. He's a little bit more, um, well, he's a Japanese figure. He didn't quite have the acclaim as others. Uh, but his form of Buddhism really took shape in dialogue with, kind of in response to, the rise of Shinto nationalism in Japan. And he is considered the founder, the founding figure, the source of Zen Buddhism in the United States. So these, these things have uh, backstories and front stories, you could say. And then uh, we're going to focus today on a figure I, I would imagine most of you are familiar with, but that's Vivekananda, uh, and um, who is associated with what is or used to be called the Dali Renaissance, representing populist uh, in, uh, Hinduism, and in some fundamental way, um, Indian. So uh, the story here, sort of conceptually, uh, is, is located in the whole colonial, post-colonial nexus, uh, where the socio-economic arrangement structured by colonialism, in particular Brit British dominance in South Asia. So Vivekananda, where we're going to begin, is part of the colonial experience, an early emergent nationalism. But then we're going to shift uh, to the present and the voice coming out of sort of the nationalist tradition. We're also spanning what is routinely referred to in the historical fields in the US is globalization one and globalization two. Globalization one being the imperial project, the spread of technology and early capitalist formation, and then globalization two being more post-World War II the financial accords that were put together then, and then more recently, the neoliberal uh, idea of kind of unleashing uh, the, the market system and the like. So we're, we're going to uh, talk between those, move from one to the other. And then finally, this notion of soft power, which has been around for about 20 years now. Joseph Nye and Harvard first articulated this back in 1990. I guess that's longer than 20 years now, but uh, the idea here is that he was talking about U.S. stuff, uh, that you have hard power, army, hard power, economy, soft power, cultural influence, and moral suasion. And so he was talking a lot about soft power, American soft power. Soft power in India has been discussed as India began to emerge as a, an economic giant in the global uh, situation.
situation. More recently, as I suggested at the outset, uh, soft power yoga or yoga diplomacy has entered into the lexicon associated with Narendra Modi. So, um, my general thesis then is soft uh, power yoga is not sort of a vague, very often when you hear about Indian soft power, they will say, oh, it's cuisine, it's music, it's Bollywood. And it's kind of vague illusions and not very specific. And my argument is really, you no, know, soft power yoga is a historically constructed phenomenon. It's got a 125 year pedigree. It's capable of being analyzed. It's institutionally embedded. It has real world consequences. It's not a, a nice vague sort of thing. Um, Excuse me. The continuities between 1893 and today are the Brahman, Vivekananda, and Yoga, are kind of central tropes that inform the whole thing. But the discontinuities are also very important. 1893, you have nascent Hindu nationalism, and then you have the spread of Asian alternative religions in the West, and that's just getting off the ground. So that's 1893. When we move to today, there are three players. You have the post-independence nation-state of India. You have a very substantial Hindu diaspora community that did not exist in 1893. And then you have a Euro-American yoga community that has somehow grown out of Vivekananda's initial visit, which is very large. And so they're all players in the soft power yoga too. So let me talk a little bit about Vivekananda and soft power yoga. One. I think it's not the switch here. Um, what you see here is where Vivekananda, the world's in exposition, where the parliament was held. This is America's greatest world's fair. Uh, and then you see the seat, the floor for the parliament there. You can pick out a number of Asian representatives, unfortunately, and I can pick there's a number of South Asians, Vivekananda text is not among them here for a reason we'll get to in a minute. So uh, the thesis here is that the parliament was the initial deployment of soft power yoga. And the parliament really establishes Vivekananda as an international player. He really launches his career in Chicago. Uh, the parliament also links Hindu nationalism, that emergent question of Hindu identity, with the promulgation of yoga in the West. Uh, at this point in time, we're really talking about Asian underdogs. They're the favorites. They're going to be the favorites. They're, they're uh, uh, and the politics and the situation are understated. So to the it's, 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 it's there, as you'll see. The setting, as I began to say, is the World's Columbian Exposition is America's greatest world's fair. Classic G1 event, globalization one event. It celebrates the rise of global culture based on science, technology, capitalist economy. These neoclassical halls you see there, gorgeous, much imitated, are housing things like electric dynamos, John Deere tractors, railroad trains, uh, and every steamship engines. So it's really a celebration of technology. Uh, it's also the U.S. announcing its attention uh, to Britain and Germany that, and France that were taken over. And uh, hence, Punch looking at this from Britain uh, a little aside. Uh, on a more idealistic note, people also saw the exposition as a vision of the 20th century when peace and prosperity would re uh, reign. End of the 19th century is riddled with a kind of optimism that is hard for us to imagine that lasts until World War I when the whole thing falls apart. The parliament here was meant to be a capstone of this event. And it's one of a large series of conferences held in Chicago that summer that are all celebrating and studying and reflecting upon universal themes such as universal public health universal moral reform, uh, universal values for the rights of women. Uh, English is a universal business language. And in that context, the parliament was meant to showcase the religious forces that would dominate the 21st century, or the 20th 
century. Um, globally inclusive, so you have some representatives from Taoism, Confucianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, very prominent. Roman Catholicism is part of the Christian tradition. A lot of Protestants, as you might imagine, a lot of British missionaries. Uh, note that it's inclusive in terms of great traditions. So people aren't there representing India, which is after all a colony of Britain, they're representing Hinduism. Uh, similarly, um, people aren't representing America or the United States, it's American Christianity. So it's that tradition. So it's a big deal, 17 days long, 200 plus speeches, thousands of documents, and undergirding it all, and this is no surprise for the end of the 19th century, there is assumption uh, that Christianity will triumph in the 20th century. So everyone's invited in to, to see the triumph of the here about the crime of Christianity. The surprise is, and this is what makes it such a remarkable event, is that the Asians steal the show. Um, the public and the press embraced the Asian representatives, especially the South Asians, the Buddhists and Sri Lankan and the Hindus. And part of it is that Soyan Shaku said some very important things between translator. And the South Asian representatives were there speaking in English. They were young, they were charismatic, uh, they had charming brogues, as the press would note. And so there was an exoticist, maybe even an eroticist element to their performance. Uh, but uh, the upshot is that the Parliament was meant to showcase Christianity or Judeo-Christian tradition in the 20th century. Instead, it showcased modernizing Hinduism and Buddhism. And that's what people found uh, really most, or what some people found really most interesting. Of course, the nationalist dimension to this wasn't seen at the time, or a little seen at the time. It's really in retrospect that historically we can make those links. Okay. Uh, so, Vivekananda, the core of the South Asian delegation were prominent uh, members of the Brahma Samaj, who gave lucid and very well received addresses reflecting that modernist, Unitarian uh, leaven that had sort of bubbled up in Bengal and it was very important to the whole movement. Roman Roy, Keshav Chandra, you can hear those voices in the remarks of the Brahmos. They were very distinguished. And there's one of the newspaper reports. Biji Mujumdar could well be Marshall Fields, who was a, a, a magnet, Chicago magnet. He just so distinguished and, and responsible. Vivekananda was not an official invitee. He shows up in Chicago. Um, but he became the most celebrated representative. He essentially launched his career in Chicago, and he expounds yoga and lectures afterwards. He, in contrast to the Brahmos, he's dressed more as a swami in some sense, there's lots of discussion about exactly what he was wearing. And he returned to India with the Chicago experience and subsequently inf informed his event, his, his subsequent career and the development of uh, that nascent nationalism. I want to talk a little about his message first on the floor of the parliament and then when he's teaching yoga. On the floor, he gives a modernist message, but it's very distinct from the Brahmos. You could say there's less Unitarianism, if you know what Unitarianism means. It's more of a populist Hinduism that reflects his affiliation with Ramakrishna. Uh, he celebrates Hindu religion as a unitary phenomenon, which is one of these con concepts that is emerging out of the Anglo-British Hindu conversation in Bengal. Um, and he puts forth what I take to be a kind of a, um, uh, well, what, what becomes a perennial message is that Hinduism is characterized by multiplicity and yet permeated by a divine unity. Uh, it's grounded in the Vedas. It has its Upanishadic 
dimensions. Uh, in the case of Vivekananda, he emphasizes Erdman uh, Krishna and Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and uh, the point here is that Hinduism is a cohesive, unified tradition. Uh, he also uh, delivers a very modernist defense of the use of images in worship, which of course at this point is still kind of a problem, particularly uh, British uh, missionaries. And his argument is basically that the human mind needs to think, has a propensity to think in images, and that the multiplicity of images simply reflects a divine unity. So he's working this ground of plurality and monism in a very modern way that is very lucid. There's nothing arcane about this at all. I mean, people understand it. Um, he delivers a criticism of uh, British missionaries, and it's not a point of assault, it's just why are you, India is so full of religion, why are you trying to bring religion to India? This is ridiculous. Uh, and then professes his own love of Jesus as a divine prophet and speaker, uh, a divine prophet and teacher. And then, and this, is, this is a critical part, of it. he's not the only Asian you know, with this rhetorical strategy, he suggests that Americans, who had discovered their own identity once free from the British, have a unique understanding of the plight of the, Hindu, the Hindus in, in India under Britain. At this point, the crowd goes wild because he's really, you know, Columbia, motherland of liberty. And people, people love this. And the press loves it. So, but the word that goes out from this performance in Chicago is very affirmative and very positive. So the point here is that at the parliament, the discussion of Hindu religion and Hindu identity as sort of concrete things emerging in India gains a public forum closely followed by the press. And Vivekananda emerges as a popular favorite, applauded by many, but not all. Of course, there's conservative American Protestants out there. Like, and for them, the parliament becomes the, a Trojan horse. Okay. So on the lecture tours, uh, uh, he spends four or five years in the United States after the parliament, and he's basically on the lecture circuit. And you can see him in picnics and spiritual retreats and dinner parties and lectures uh, talking about well, the universalizing message is there from the parliament, um, but he's um, also beginning to teach the practice of yoga to people who are kind of drifting outside the church. So these are metaphysical Christians, theosophists, physical culturists, health food people, are really attracted to him. Um, there's a little static coming up here, I don't know. Uh, in 1869, he publishes Raja Yoga, which is one of his first publications. And this really captures very interestingly what's going on there, is that it's, the book is based on stenographic notes he gave teaching to alternative spiritual seekers in the United States. So there's a kind of a hybrid synthesis going on in the text, where he is shaping his remarks for them, and they are giving him feedback. And one of the arguments out there is that his particular brand of yoga kind of takes shape in that hybrid context of teaching in the US. Uh, and then before returning to India, he founds the Vedanta Society, which is the first, um, I don't know, I, I don't know if this is still working or not. But can you hear me in the back without it? It's not working. Is it off? It's off. Yeah, it's off. It just started to. I'll, I'll just continue and we'll, we'll see how things go. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah? Okay. So he introduces many elements new to this U.S. popular audience, including Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, elements of Bhakti and Nandual Vedanta. It all kind of gets run together. Uh, and yoga in this context is not asana-based yoga. He is talking about meditation, contemplation in the kind of Upanishadic, Vedanta sort of way. And that's really where the foundation 
uh, for uh, yoga is laid in the United States. Um, and I, I want to give a, a, a clear picture of these people that he's talking to. These are people who are drifting outside of the institutional church. They're kind of free floating. And he is kind of decoupling Hindu philosophy and yoga practice from the social context of yoga in India. So there's a, 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 a fresh space being created where yoga is uh, being promoted. Um, so the take home point is that uh, Vivekananda, this is a soft core yoga point, soft uh, core yoga point, um, exerts influence on behalf of Hindu identity and the nationalist movement on a global stage through promoting Hindu religion, philosophy, and yoga. The audience, uh, nationalists at home, and these emerging American spiritual seekers in the United States. There's no diaspora community at this point. And the carriers of this are very interesting to know. The Brahmo Samaj today would probably be called a religious NGO. And Vivekananda is basically a free agent. And so this is, this is kind of grassroots is welling up doing this first part of uh, yoga power, soft power yoga number one. Um, any questions or clarifications? I'll get a drink here of water. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, we often uh, demand yoga as a form of informal asanas. But uh, <coughs> we always try to make up with the propaganda of meditation, uh, contemplation, and uh, self evaluatory uh, asanas. So, is there a thin line between this two categories of yoga, or yoga is more famous for, for its asanas? Well, <clears throat> it's a very good question, and we're kind of getting to that. And, and after we're over, I can tell you about some new literature. Uh, we'll be talking about some new literature. Uh, both have ancient antiquity. I think the current view on this is that non-asana yoga is older. Asanas really emerge with Hatha Yoga, which is a much later development. And there's a reason why Hatha Yoga in the West is so important. We can talk about that later, okay? Because uh, I want to move on to Soft Power Yoga 2 here, uh, which is really ultimately Narendra Modi. Um, and the thesis here is that uh, the Parliament Yoga, uh, Vivekananda and Yoga are the driving force in this very different deployment of soft power yoga by Narendra Modi. They're kind of tropes in his discourse, in his development, um, so they're important. Uh, but there are major shifts. The parliament at this point is not a real-time event. It's a selectively remembered event. Vivekananda is not a young, charismatic speaker, but an icon or image, or even Murti, perhaps. Um, it's not a free agent who is promoting soft power yoga too, but the very centers of Indian state power. Uh, and then in the US, it's going to sort of be received by both a Euro-American yoga community that is really very large. There's figures of up to 20 million people in the US practice yoga. And on the other hand, the uh, Indo-American diaspora community. So. Um, what I need to do here is to um, give you a little background. Oh, can one of you just make that back where it should be? So what I now need to give you a little background on these two communities in the US. And first I'll talk about the diaspora community and the Hindu America Foundation in particular. There's now a burgeoning South Asian uh, Hindu community in, in the US that's been building for 50 years. Uh, they're engaged in institution building, getting out in the public arena, public relations, action groups, uh, the US politics of identity, what's going on in the Hindu American group is a classic sort of stage of development in the United States. Every immigrant group that has come in has had to work to figure out how to present themselves and 
carve out their niche and figure out their issues. And that's what's going on in the diaspora community today. Um, in, in, so I want to talk a little bit about HAF, uh, the, the Indo-American Foundation, which was founded in 2003, and so it's not very, very old. In 2008, it begins what they call the Take Back Yoga Campaign. And it begins by the editor of the magazine, uh, their, their, their mouthpiece, basically, their newsletter, a writing yoga journal, which is the glossy main commercial yoga magazine in the United States, uh, and charging them with decoupling yoga from Hinduism. They might mention Patanjali, they might mention India, but they're not going to use the word Hindu. And so they charge them with, with this as a uh, is a politics of identity issue. Uh, it, 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 what, and what starts is kind of a kind of a modest complaint soon spirals into a very large uh, development. Fourth magazine gets into it, Al Jazeera, Huffington Post, everyone's commenting on this. And it turns into public debates where people representing Hindu America Foundation are arguing that uh, Decoupling uh, yoga from Hinduism is disenfranchising two million American Hindus, and uh, then who rejoin the rejoinder is taken up by Deepak Chopra, who's you know so, so it turns into one of those large events. But emerging from it are some very American questions: Who owns yoga? Can there be Christian and Jewish yoga? Can yoga be secular? Can yoga be done in public schools? So all of these things just begin to refract all over the place. So that's one side of the equation. Meanwhile, over in the Euro-American community, um, which has burgeoned since Vivekananda arrived, um, Yoga is largely removed from Hindu institutions. Uh, it's associated with people who think of them as having a spirituality, but not a religion. Most yoga centers are small businesses run by devoted yogis. Uh, plus, there's a very large gear industry, something like $5 billion a year, in yoga mats and yoga pants and whatever you want. But running through all of this, there's a perennial question in the United States when it comes to Asian religions, and that's what to do with the 2,000-year-old history of a religion. What do we do with it? Back when I was your age, students here, everyone wanted the most authentic, the most ancient, the most disciplined, the most ascetic, you know, the truest, deepest. Now it's swung completely to the other extreme where everyone's after. Highly secularized, very sleek, accommodated to bourgeois living, uh, helping one work uh, well in the corporate setting. So, so in that context, I want to ask Yoga Body, and we can come back and talk about this book a little bit. This was published in 2010. And it's really, it's kind of a messy book in some respects, but he's going back and he's saying, how did the U.S. get so involved in doing yoga as exercise? And it's kind of going back and asking some historical questions. Um, why, why asanas? Why exercise? Why power yoga? How did this happen? And it was widely covered in the community. And then a few years later, and this is both in American Buddhism and in the yoga community, People were beginning to ask, or have we gotten too secular? Gee, isn't there a religious foundation to a lot of this? Uh, Tricycle, which is a Buddhist publication, writes, instead of denying, and this is just this last summer, instead of denying or ignoring a religious dimension, we should seek to find ways to cultivate and develop it so that in our time it can be rediscovered and re-envisioned. Re uh, yoga Health on Facebook published in July, in the era of disco yoga and pole dancing yoga, 
Are we losing sight of what the ancient practice is really about? So the point here is, yeah. <laughs> so the point here is, and this is sort of the background for Narendra Modi's visit. On the one hand, the diaspora community is asking these politics of identity questions of who owns yoga. The Euro-American yoga community is saying, isn't there more to this than beauty and good abs, you know? So, so enter Modi. But we have to back up a little bit in order to, to, to pick up Vivekananda again. Because Vivekananda has two different histories. In America, he is associated as a charismatic, humanistic, spiritual teacher, a true Swami. And because he's preaching, teaching to alternative people, he is by definition a progressive person. Over in India, he develops in a much more complex way as both a spiritual teacher and student of Ramakrishna, associated with Ramakrishna, and as someone who's associated with the national, early national movement. So he's a much more uh, complex person. Um, what you're seeing here is called the Chicago Pose. So Chicago comes back into this. This is the one that's used on one of the famous posters for the parliament. Uh, and here you see the full body pose. There you see the one that's really the most publicized. And his interpretation on this goes, uh, the Chicago pose emphasizes Vivekananda's public presence and authority, as opposed to the Samadhi pose, which represents his spiritual cultivation. So as I'm sure many of you are probably familiar, and I'm just kind of reporting out of the literature here, the Chicago pose is his most famous pose. And so that public authority is very important. And he's seen in, in dozens of representations as the lion of Vedanta, a, a great yogi and ascetic, thus spake uh, Vedakananda. Uh, you know, a quintessential modern uh, philosopher, uh, the postage stamp. You know, this is really quite amazing that this is the building in which the parliament was held. It's still there in Chicago. And that's the Chicago Pose, and, and this is only one version of the India stamps on which he appears. I'm particularly fond of the juxtaposition of these two <coughs> images. Uh, this down here is one of the often published photographs from the official documents from the parliament. And this is Dharma Paula here. Here's Vivekananda. His name escapes me right at the moment. Um, but here in a 1993 movie on the life of Vivekananda, they've replicated that, which just underscores the importance of that parliament moment in Chicago. And even the line, and I who never spoke in public in my life to address this august assembly, kind of underscores part of the Vivekananda myth, and that is this sort of savant, unschooled savant shows up in, in Chicago and just devastates the crowd with his rhetorical brilliance. So this is very, you know, a very important part of, of, of um, the background here. Um, and I think I have a... So we have to begin to segue to Mr. Modi because um, Vivekananda and Chicago are informing images for Modi's soft power yoga. Um, this is what I've kind of gleaned from the press. I'm certainly no expert on Modi's spirituality, but he is said to be unabashed about his devotion for Vivekananda. Dhyanana Saraswati also plays a role in this. In his 20s, he made a youthful pilgrimage to sites associated with Vivekananda and Ramakrishna. Uh, he kicked off his Gujarat campaigns, I think it's the 2012 campaign, on the day of kind of interest, on the day Vivekananda gave his speech in Chicago. So he's clearly making an identification there. And the picture you get from the press, you know, kind of a neutral press, 
is that he's frugal, religious, hardworking, vegetarian, a yogi. He does daily asanas. And there are quotes when he talks about, oh, man, when my day gets really rough, I do pranayama and get my head back in order. Um, there's a quote that I thought was particularly, and this quote makes sense to people in the US who don't know anything about this. Um, but in Kolkata, Swami Vivekananda had become calendar art, a monk in an orange turban, his head raised towards heaven, hanging listlessly on kitchen walls, bathed in the sickly pallor of Juan Tube light. Narendra Modi has rescued him from, from presiding over the sizzle in Bengali kitchens and turned him loose on the highways and byways of Gujarat. <laughs> so, you know, there's a really dynamic, which from my point of view in America, as an American is looking at this stuff, is so rich and so marvelous, and then there is the politics, you know, which is something else. So Modi's visit, this is all kind of brought to a head. Um, <laughs> with Modi's visit to the U.S. Um, as a governor, he was largely unknown. I, you know, some people obviously knew who he was, but, but basically he was an unknown. The press to bring people up to speed on who Modi was would emphasize a couple of things. One, economic development. He's a globalization two guy, you know? He's a Hindu conservative who's also a neoliberal when it comes to economic development, which for a lot of people in the United States is a really good combination. Um, <laughs> questions about the 2002 Gujarat riots, the communal violence, are noted usually said people charge him with not preventing or abetting. You know, and I don't know anything about that, but that people felt the need to get that out there. And then of course the travel travel bans uh, to the UK, US, and the EU. Um, and then he's elected. Anus Mirabilus, everything's over. He's invited to within four or five months. He's in the United States. Um, so I want to sort of begin to pull this together by just talking about that Chicago visit and then I'll be able to sort of wrap things up. Um, first of all, his wardrobe got a lot of coverage. He's a globalization to fashion guy, there's no question about that. The designer frames, really good, well-cut suits. And Michelle Obama talks about him as our new fashion icon. You know, that gets quoted out there. <laughs> and I think it's funny, it's easy to laugh at you, but I think that charisma is important. That's part of the image. And as we, we all know, we live in a very image-driven society. Uh, so he arrives in the U.S., and on the first day, he goes to Ground Zero, which is kind of one of the absolute musts, I think, for the diplomatic circuit at this point. Then he goes to Central Park, to speak with diaspora youth. Uh, and this is the only time he speaks in English. Um, he concludes his address, which is we're kind of not particularly uh, fantastic, kind of youth-oriented, with Sanskrit mantras, and then with let the force be with you, which of course speaks right to the American context. And then he goes off uh, to the UN, and he proposes uh, International Yoga Day before the General Assembly. And I found this address kind of interesting. Um, I would describe it as a modernist description in universalistic terms with an introductory nod to India's ancient wisdom. And he talks in terms of this modernist discourse of multiplicity and unity, multilateralism in politics, that's India's genius. Uh, he has a sweeping address that touches upon Pakistan, democracy, G2 development, the Arab Spring, the success of Tunisia. But it's really a development address. You know? And then this, this, then right at the end, he begins to shift. And I, and I, I thought, we need to change our lifestyles 
energy not consumed is the cleanest energy. We can achieve the same level of development, prosperity, and well-being without going down the reckless path, uh, the path of rec reckless consumption. Our economies will take on a different character. That appeals to so many people in the United States who, who you know, we're, we're kind of sainted on consumerism in many respects. So. Um, for us, India, respect for nature is an integral part of spiritualism. And then here's the off-sided paragraph. Yoga is an invaluable gift of our tradition. It embodies unity of mind and body, thought and action, restraint and fulfillment, harmony between man and nature, holism. It is not about exercise, but to discover the sense of oneness, of self, world, and nature. By changing our lifestyle and creating consciousness, Will help us deal with climate change. I mean, whether you know what you, you can take this rhetoric seriously or call it empty rhetoric, I'm not, I don't really know. But it's really very appealing, and where I'm kind of going with this uh, has to do with with the success of his rhetoric. But uh, the next day, he talks to the American Jewish community. These are the arbiters of diaspora consciousness in the United States. These are the go-to people power in the diaspora. Then he talks to the Hindu-American community. Uh, then he goes to Madison Square Garden. Many of you probably, how many of you heard about the Madison Square Garden event? A few, yeah? Reuters, India rock star PM Wow's Madison Square Garden. <laughs> they wore his face on their chest, waved it on posters, chanted his name, quoted his slogans, 19,000 fans drawn to the single star. You know, you, you get rhetoric. The American part of this is really, I, I think, it is, and when the man himself emerged, the capacity crowd on Sunday in New York's most storied arena, this is Madison Square Garden, roared as one as if all the Knicks, all the Rangers, two athletic teams, Billy Joel, and Bruce Springfield. <laughs> Modi, Modi, Modi. Embracing the adulation of the diaspora that maintains strong pasture. <laughs> the substance of the dress is development. And part of what people said came out of the visit was uh, something called the Indian Diaspora Investment Initiative. Trying to smooth the way for Indian diaspora, Hindu Americans, Indian diaspora. To invest back in India. The next day, he meets with uh, ten plus CEOs, Goldman Sachs. He meets the Clintons. He meets with the Council on Foreign Relations. And he flies to Washington. In Washington, he meets with Russian leaders. He visits the Lincoln, Martin Luther King, and Gandhi memorials, which makes perfect sense, of course. And then he meets Obama at the White House. I don't exactly know what the substance of this meeting was. But what comes out of it, and this is just one of those little facts that lets you know your argument is going to work, is that Obama gives him what is purported to be a very rare book, it's not, I know, a very rare book of addresses from the Chicago Department of Religions, which included Vivekananda's startling address, along with various uh, photographs. And the first post reports the day later that, that when he tweeted his 50 million followers, President Barack Obama, and here's a tweet, uh, presented to me a very valuable gift that I will cherish forever. He gave me a rare book on the Parliament of the World's and Religions of 1893, uh, which contains the paper of Sui Salman David Karanda. So this is the cover, this is the address, and this is actually a very famous photograph of Darla Pala and Vivekananda and a couple of other people at the Chicago Exposition that's been reproduced hundreds of times. Um, originally, it would have been the Hindustani delegates, and now it's more South Asian representatives, so the, the tenor of things has shifted. So, um, <coughs> let me then move on to uh, International Day of Yoga. And just remind you, we're kind of working with both the diaspora and the European community. And I want to give you 
three different views. Uh, part of what's been introduced in here is that he comes back from the U.S. and establishes Ayush, which is now referred to in the West as the Ministry of Yoga, but it's Ayurvedic and yoga and, and a bunch of other things, kind of an alternative, um, I'm not sure what it is, an alternative kind of Department of Health. Um, and, you know, this is from an Indian source, the world bows to yoga as India launches International Day. Style, Pian Moni calls it the beginning. And I'm not sure what the beginning of what, you know, he is referring to here. Um, but I want to give you, uh, in, in conclusion, just sort of three different views of what's going on. And my argument is that despite the different emphasis, all these people cite Modi. All these people cite his UN performance as a source of inspiration, but in very different contexts. So Modi at this moment is articulating a kind of consensus rhetoric or bottom line about what yoga is. Um, so the first I want to just talk a little bit about India. This is from the Washington Post, which I take as fairly authoritative. And he's commenting here on the UN address leading up to International Day, <coughs> International Yoga Day. And it's actually an interview with um, uh, Sripad Naik, who is head, put at the head of this new ministry. And among the quotes is, is this, there's little doubt about yoga being an Indian art form. We're trying to establish to the world that it is ours. And then they go down to the Desai National Institute of Yoga, which is now called the government's premier yoga academy. I don't know quite what that means. But they interview students there. And the West has manipulated yoga for their own benefits. It's more like exercise. But traditional yoga is much more than that. It's about achieving enlightenment for the soul. It's making us aware of something that is ours, part of our heritage. So there's that, that ownership element going on in the Indian context, in the press at least. The bottom left is the diaspora community, HAF, and this is such a classic ethnic politics of identity move. HAF puts together a yoga day ceremony in the Capitol building. And they bring together Republican and Democratic uh, staffers, and they do three things. First of all, there's a uh, HAF-sponsored art show of the contemplative arts of yoga. There had been a big Smithsonian show on that just the year before, so this sort of ties in with that. They have 30 minutes of asanas led by a, uh, a Euro-American who is associated with a long-term yoga lineage in the United States. And then they have 30 minutes of guided meditation by someone associated with diaspora community. So there's a very careful politics there. And then um, a resolution is introduced into Congress uh, by Tulsi Gabbar, who's a Democrat of Hawaii and the first Hindu elected to Congress. The substance of that re resolution is a direct quote from Modi's UN address. And then she adds, it's been a great weekend of celebration and a real opportunity to help spread awareness of the true meaning of yoga. While the physical benefits are well known, there are deeper understandings of yoga that, that help us recognize our divinity. So there's, you know, bringing that aspect of it into the Capitol building in a context of politics of identity. And then third is Yoga Journal. And here the tenor is very different. This is just a pop journal. Grab your mats and practice with yogis around the world for the first ever International Yoga Day. And it goes on to talk about all the stupid June days, like Chocolate Ice Cream Day, and Upsa Daisy Day, and Donald Duck Day. Now there's a day that we can really get behind, First International Yoga Day. And then they go on with a little video clip on their website to give three variations of the salutation to the sun asana from three different lineages and how you might prepare to do that, uh, concluding Mr. Modi from the UN, 
quotes him at length and then says, whether you spend that day in the company of esteemed, of an esteemed 10,000 yogis in Times Square, or on your mat in your own living room, set your intention to become part of this and transcendent day, namaste. So, you know, you, you get three different views here. And I wanted to extrapolate here and then we're basically done. Modi's UN yoga rhetoric speaks to Hindu, Hindu Americans and Euro Americans. There's a bottom line, bottom line consensus. The elements of which are yoga is a universal science of health uh, related to the global human. We can easily take that for granted, but that's a huge global ideological accomplishment, ultimately. He didn't do it on his own, obviously, but, but he's underscoring that. There's a sense that there is, or there ought to be, more to yoga than fitness. There's a sense that yoga and yoga lifestyle is a strategy for sustainability. I can't think of a person who does yoga. It, I couldn't ask, is yoga a green practice? Uh, asanas are here to stay. This is part of the shift that has taken place. And there's a history to that shift that we could talk about that. And, and this finally, ancientness as authority. That's really important. In that debate, in the HAF debate, some are saying yoga is more ancient than Hinduism, others are saying Hinduism is more ancient than yoga. American yogis, oh, it's 80,000 years old. Oh, you know, it's, that ancientness is very important, even if it's a little hysterical at times. Now, and here's the important thing, I think. Yoga's, this consensus obscures big differences. Uh, yoga's linked to Hinduism, for instance. It's from very light to highly embedded, you could say. You know, from romantic illusions to sectarian and that's not just East and West. There are Americans who do yoga who are really deeply into Patanjali and austerity. And there's plenty of people over here, I think, who are doing power yoga as well. So it's, you can't easily do that divide. There's different political meanings for ancientness. In the US, the vision of people doing the salute to the sun on the terraces of Mahendadaro is powerful. And it's romantic and it's lovely, but it has no real political meaning. And over here, of course, it can take on a much more deep political meaning tied to arguments about Hinduism. Uh, I want to kind of wrap up a little bit by pointing to a textual issue that I found really fascinating as I worked through this material. Mo uh, Modi says yoga is an invaluable gift of our ancient tradition. When you begin to look at Indian reports of that speech, they will say yoga is 5,000 years old, then Modi's it is a great gift, and then they'll go on to the quote. So they preface that quote with the 5,000 years, which is the 2,000 years of the Christian era plus 3,000 years back to the Indus Valley civilization. When you get to the Wikipedia entry on International Yoga Day, that sentence about 5,000 years is the second sentence to Modi's quote. So there's a, a real fabrication of something going on there. So I just want to conclude then by saying that uh, I think I've made my argument. This is not just a vague illusion. There's a 125-year pedigree to this soft power uh, yoga. And uh, but it means different things in different contexts. And I, I won't repeat myself. I think you've gotten the point. Um, but I guess my general conclusion here, and I'm getting a little tired, and you're probably getting a little tired too, is that we know how South Power Yoga one played out. Vivekananda and his crew were successful. Yoga came and burgeoned in the US. We don't really know what's going to happen, if anything, with Soft Power Yoga 2. But uh, there are some very benign and marvelous aspects of it. But we know it's also tied to some deeper currents 
of political uh, business that we just can't see how they're going to play out. So having said that, why well, I conclude, and maybe there's still time for some questions. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Peter. Um, because we heard about yoga as a commodity, yoga as a tool, and we don't really know what yoga means. I think that's my brief comment, and we can take some questions. So let, let's start with students and then we can. As yoga integrates a way of life, it also includes some medical practices like Ayurveda and Siddha. When it goes to USA, my question is, uh, does it take uh, Ayurveda and Siddha with itself and uh, is there any contradiction or rejection towards uh, these medicines in the light of uh, politics of pharmaceutical industry and oh. patents and uh, <coughs> something like that uh, which uh, keeps to maintain monopoly that uh, allopathic or other medical system in comparison to this uh, traditional medical system from either India, China or many other places. Well, there also Chinese traditional <coughs> medical medical uh, system got to uh, Nobel Prize also. So. I think I can only answer that in general terms and one is in many places yoga is pretty closely tied to Ayurvedic medicine. Not tied, they kind of travel together. And plenty of people who do yoga will also turn on to Ayurvedic medicine. How deep that is, how sophisticated it is, is a whole different question. The second part of your question is that there is a, over the last 30 years, there's been a real growth in alternative uh, uh, medical system. They're now called more complementary because there is, in many places, an attempt to integrate classic Western medicine and alternative therapies and medicinal uh, things that you're talking about when you mention Ayurveda. I, I can't take on the corporate culture question part of that. It's too big. And I, and I don't know really, honestly, how to answer that. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for your comments. Uh, I have a question that uh, we are kind of linking yoga, the period of 18 